And I am exceedingly happy to be able to introduce our next speaker, who happens to be a People College Scholar. I've known this student, as many of our staff has as well, since he was in the ninth grade at Racing Case High School in Racine, Wisconsin. He graduated from high school in 2010 and became a UW-Madison Badger. As a high school student, he exhibited academic excellence, strong leadership, and community service. For example, he founded at Racing Case High School a program called Minority Visionary Program, MVP. The goals of that program were to expose students to college, to provide a support system for students through peer-to-peer -peer tutoring, and also coordinated guest speakers such as the mayor, community organizers, and college students. To, to this day, he continues to mentor the presidents of that organization. And I have to tell you, as a result of those efforts, we've seen a tremendous increase in the number of students from Racing Case applying to be in the People Program and getting additional exposure to become potential future uh, UW-Madison Badgers. As a UW-Madison student, he continues to excel academically and in leadership as well as service. He's a member of the Academic Advancement Program. He's a member of the Associated Students of Madison, both um, with regards to the Student Council as well as the Student Services Finance Committee. He's a representative of the Lambda Theta Pi Latin Fraternity, the Vice President of the Gamma Theta Chapter, and as a freshman last year, he was the recipient of the Bucky Outstanding Freshman Award, which was um, rendered by the Center for Leadership and Involvement. And in addition, he also attended the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity uh, in San Francisco last year, and I have to tell you, he went in there with a storm. He not only identified a need, but was placed in the position of being the first Latino caucus student chair. Please join me in welcoming our People College Scholar, Mr. Arturo Diaz. Hello, everyone. Uh, like Jackie said, my name is Tito, and I'm very honored here to speak in front of you all today. Uh, I was asked here to talk about my UW experience on campus, and um, my UW experience starts all the way back to when I first stepped foot on this campus, and uh, thanks to the People Program, uh, back in ninth grade. So while I was in the program, it taught me a lot of values. It taught me how to communicate with my peers and staff, that, uh, and that allowed me to become more of a social person. <clears throat> it also taught me that working hard school, in school pays off well, because in the end you can attend such a great university like this. It also inspired me to create a program, like Jackie said, called the Minority Visionary Program, which helped students um, gear up for college. While I was in the People Program my third year, I participated in a law internship. This internship exposed me to the law school, and it was there that I decided when I got older, I wanted to help out other people and give back in any way I can by either becoming a lawmaker or a community organizer. The People Program helped me, helped me steer me in this direction. <clears throat> it also helped me understand that college was a goal that I can achieve, and not only that, once that goal is achieved, that I can graduate from this university. My first semester was in the SCE program, also known as the Summer Collegiate Experience, here at the university. This experience was one of the best so far in my life. It gave me a picture of how college would be. It, it exposed me how to um, interact with my professors and TAs. Then the fall semester started and I lived on the Multicultural Learning Community, also known as the MLC in Woody Hall. It was there that the multiculturalism hit me. It was there that you could walk down the halls, hear many different languages spoken through the halls, hear many different genres of music. It was what it said it was a, to, out to be, a multicultural setting. With a very good support system like the People Program in MLC, I decided to run for a freshman seat on ASM, also known as the Associated Students of Madison. It is the official student government of UW-Madison. I had the support of the MLC, SCE participants, and my 2010 People cohort. I won a seat and decided to be a voice for those students who needed one. 
also the, my fall semester, I was volunteering at Centro Hispano, which is a, let, or a Hispanic student or, or a Hispanic community outreach center that is focuses on community organizing and helping out the community. There, I help tutor high school um, juniors and seniors and try to be a resource for them to succeed. I was also the director of the Whitty Hall organization. The Whitty Hall organization, also known as WHO, was an organization that set up many events for Whitty uh, residents. So I ran the meetings and also put on many events. My spring, my spring semester started off really well. I was still involved in ASM and the student council and two other committees known as the Diversity Committee and Nominations Board. I then joined the Latino fraternity on campus. And the reason was to create that real family connection and to have people I can call my brothers. Election time came again for other seats in ASM. I decided to run for the Student Service Finance Committee, also known as the SSFC, which is the financial branch of the government. I want a seat with the most votes coming in first out of five open seats and had one of the best voter turnouts in SSFC history. My first year of college ended really well. I received four different awards, one from the MLC for my volunteering, one for who for my leadership, one for my fraternity for my involvement on campus, and my last award, and which is one of my most prized, is I received the buckets for the most outstanding freshman from the Center of Leadership and Involvement, which oversees all student organizations on campus. I also ended my year with having over 90, year, or 90 hours of volunteering, a solid GPA, joining organizations that allowed me to help out my peers and community, joining a Latino fraternity, and being named freshman of the year. After my first year of college ended, I was given the opportunity to go to San Francisco, California to attend the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity, also known as NCOR. This conference was about diversity in higher education and how race and ethnicity plays a role in our education. This was a professional development leadership conference and I learned a great deal and was inspired to bring it all back to campus. I then was inspired to be a student voice there at that conference as well. Um, in the conference, at each, there's a, each caucus tailored to each ethnic group, and I attended the Latino caucus, and it was there that I was elected student chair and was now in charge of running student meetings and making sure that students had a voice at NCOR. As for this year, I'm still working with ASM and both the student council on the diversity committee and also the student service finance committee. Also as vice president and historian, and I am also vice president and historian for my fraternity. Also when this year started off, a little, um, we also know that this year started off a little hectic with a report that some of us are familiar with. Um, in less than 24 hours of notice, I was able to help mobilize a lot of students and get us ready to rally to show that this report was nothing that we wanted. All of my accomplishments, awards, and successes could not have been done alone. I had some big influences in my life. The first being my mother for all she has done for me, the people program for opening all the doors that I can now um, open, and also the a or AAP, also known as the Academic Advancement Program, for all the support. So I would like to thank all of them for the help they have given me. Lastly, if there is one thing that you would be able to take away from my speech today, is that <clears throat> there are many communities on campus, like the People, MLC, AAP, ASM, and Multicultural Greek Life. And it is there that these communities breed success. My story shows that such things can help launch off people into great success. It also shows that these communities breed leaders and help graduate students as well. These communities are necessary to the University of Wisconsin-Madison because they are furthering our campus and the Wisconsin idea, an idea that guides our campus and that we all live day by day. And that is something that I'm proud to say and part of and proud to say that I am part of these communities. So thank you all for listening and your time, and thank you. Thank you so much, Tito. Uh, I know that those of you in this room know many students like Tito. But there's some in this room who don't seem to know students like Tito. And it's for that reason that we've been pressured and presented with questions that we need to respond to. Because folks don't seem to understand that badgers come in many 
different identities. That students come to this great university out of different circumstances, not to reify what is, but to redefine what could be. Now, I had a particular talk I was going to give today, and I started rethinking it just a little bit. Um, but but I, I, I would like to begin by thanking all of my colleagues again in academic planning and analysis. We've got a little APA contingent over there. Could the APA contingent just stand up, please, for me? Let's thank APA. The, the slide that you have here uh, indicates where you will be able to go to get the details of the uh, diversity data uh, overview report that they do annually. Uh, and it has the slides, if you'd like to use them in talks you're doing, in grants you're doing, in projects that you're doing, in whatever way uh, that you may be engaging this work. Um, it is uh, comprehensive in so many ways of the institutional data that we have on campus. And having had a chance to work at multiple institutions and visit even more, it's very rare that an institution has the type of data capacity that we have to ask questions to help us with our academic agenda. And so I'm very appreciative of their leadership today as always. Um, I'd like to begin my remarks with a quote from uh, uh, now two-year interim Chancellor Ward. I don't, I don't know if you're two years if you still get to get called interim still or, or if you just become Chancellor again. That, that remains to be seen. But, but the quote is as follow. The question is not if we're going to change or if things are going to go back to the way they were. We must and they are not. The question for us is how can we have the right conversation now and into the future about how we will change to respond to the challenges and opportunities that we are presented. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a higher education administrative policy junkie. So every time I hear Chancellor Ward speak, I sit there with my little recorder because he says something incredibly profound. Um, I thought that this commentary was incredibly profound, delivered in multiple different spaces, but talking about the moment that we're in institutionally as we recharter what it means and reconsider what it means to be a great public university in the world we live in today. A world that's characterized by several dynamics. As we turn the lens of diversity to this question of innovation, change, and where we are, I think about this perfect storm moment that we find ourselves in. A perfect storm moment that's not pushing diversity issues to the backdrop, but as we heard this morning from our wonderful speakers, continues to elevate, strengthen, and inform the work that each of us is dedicated to in all of the myriad of ways that we're engaging it at this institution changing demographics, educational trends, the emergence of a global knowledge economy, continuing and persisting societal and educational inequities. And we heard deeply in that message this morning, the educational and business case for diversity. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that just a bit this morning. And also, too, as we've also heard, political and legal dynamics that prioritize the way we must engage our work to ensure that we speak with the same message, that we engage our work with the same attention to risk mitigation at the same time that we work to expand possibilities in our work. Now, this is some data that illustrates where we are institutionally over the last several years with respect to undergraduate students. And what you can see from these data is that while we have realized some gains, we remain still steady and relatively flat. I know the academic planning and analysis folks are looking at me like, how'd that slide get changed in color? It got changed in color because my computer just decided it wanted to do it different. <laughs> see, I'm a Mac guy, and that oftentimes can happen. But what we see here generally, though, is, is it's relatively flat. Uh, but we have realized some gains, and those gains have come hard fought through the efforts of amazing diversity programs that we have on campus through the efforts of committed alumni who partner with us in so many different ways, through the daily work that's done by the Office of Undergraduate Recruitment and Admissions, the individuals in uh, uh, the Financial Aid Office, the Vice Provost for Enrollment Management, alumni across the country who are consistently and persistently trying to help us to push those numbers forward. Chancellor Ward said something very interesting to me very recently. He said, I can't even believe anybody would question these numbers. He said, they're not very good at all. But yet still, questions do persist. 
And the thing that I say is that the work that we do now in a global knowledge economy is more important than ever before. The chart that you have before you now depicts uh, two different uh, pieces of data, time and also salary. And it has the annual salaries of different educational strata. And what you see is that individuals identify there with the difference between some college, which is red, and a college degree, which is green, and the two red lightning bolts, you see that that gap is persisting and persisting and persisting and persisting and just increasing as we move forward. And so what is the implication of that? The implication of that is that the work that we do is more important than ever before. It's more important than ever before, and it continues to elevate. There are individuals in this room today who I just absolutely adore because they always ask me questions. And I hope that they come forward to the Q&A and ask other questions because I think that those questions are important to be asked. There's individuals who have said to me, you know, every time I see you, I'm going to be on the attack with respect to diversity efforts. Every time I see you, I'm going to be on the attack. And the thing that I say is we invite the questions. We invite those who want to know more because we believe so deeply institutionally in what we're doing and how we're doing it. And we will say that to anyone who asks the question. But as we look across this university, we see that we live in an age of diversity. While some may want to minimize the conversation to one factor of diversity, we know that diversity comes in so many different identity characteristics. Continuing learners who are championed by programs like the Odyssey program, who provides opportunity for individuals who are in an economically vulnerable situation and continuing forward. Not just the work that we do through Jackie DeWalt's unit and the People program, but a myriad of ways that we engage diversity on this campus. Disability accessibility, economic background, diversity of geographic background, gender equity, so many different ways that diversity plays out in our campus at the same time that we know that the greatest challenge of the 20th and continuing, as we heard this morning, of the 21st century continues to be the challenge of race and ethnicity. Race and ethnicity, particularly at the intersection of economic background. And as we heard today, also at the intersection of gendered identity. Continuing confounding challenges and problems and issues that we must understand. One of the things I want to stress and have each of you walk away from is that we should all have an understanding of how the Michigan decisions move the conversation in a particular type of way. Championing the educational benefits of diversity. Legal cases defended in that particular institution's case, which went all the way to the Supreme Court, which talked about these issues not in terms of being the moral or social, or social justice or uh, ethical thing to do, which it is, but talked about it clearly and powerfully and prominently in the language of learning and educational, and educational outcomes that come from having a robust, diverse learning environment. It's for that reason that we have a CEO program that shares only acronym with others <laughs> and is dedicated 100% to first-generation college students. It's for that reason that we have a, 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 a posse program. It's for those reasons that we have a LGBTQ resource center so that we could be supportive of the entirety of our community at the same time that in creating a supportive context, we create a more powerful context for learning to emerge. The corporate community is very excited about diversity and thinks it's a matter of prominence and importance because they're concerned about the business case for diversity. African American, Asian, Hispanic, Native American communities annually as of 2009 representing $2.3 trillion in spending power. Women control over 80% of the household decisions made as it relates to the budget and all other things. <laughs> At least that's what my wife tells me. The LGBTQA community representing in excess of $700 billion in spending power. So the corporate community has no loss of understanding. They have great clarity around why this is so important. And what becomes interesting is that as this storm elevates the issues and whatnot, they look to us. So the work that we do is in response to that demand. Because in the 21st century, we're talking about diversity issues as a strategic imperative, a mission-driven imperative. Pictures depicted here of the Multicultural Student Job Fair, 
hosted by the Career, uh, uh, Career Planning Office in Letters and Science in partnership with the Multicultural Student Center and the leadership of Dante Hilliard in the Division of Student Life. Admissions possible, Aerotech, Alcoa, Altria, American Family, AmeriCorps, Capital One, Cargill, City of Madison Police Department, City Year Milwaukee, on and on and on. They're recruiting, trying to find diverse graduates that they wanted to employ, a business case. But a business case that doesn't end simply with trying to populate with diverse bodies, but an understanding that there's power in difference. A colleague at the University of Michigan, Scott Page in the business school, has written, uh, has done a wealth of research that talks about difference in its myriad of forms and how the presence of difference with the presence of talent nearly always trumps simply the presence of talent. Now, no one's saying don't have talent. What we're saying is that the presence of diversity combined with talent creates a rich context for solution building for creativity, for innovation. The key tenets of success in a knowledge economy, the key tenets of success in a world where students are gonna change jobs not once, not twice, not three times, but estimated seven to 10 times in their career in the first 15 years. A world that we live in that is gonna increasingly be known as free agent nation, where each and every student is a living brand, each individual is a living brand. Change, complexity, Connectivity, requiring an understanding of how to engage with difference. And there was a survey that was done, a study that was done by colleagues at the Association of American Colleges and University, which surveyed several hundred corporate leaders. And they asked them, what would you like to see more emphasis placed on in terms of the learning outcomes that come from students? What would you like to see more emphasis placed upon? 82% responded, we want to see more in terms of their understanding of science and technological issues, 72% global issues. Skipping down, 76% said we'd like to see a greater understanding of how student graduates are able to engage in teams, how they're able to engage with difference. Again, not a matter of just something to do, not a matter of just trying to do it to serve a small purpose, but it's about being strategically relevant in the world that we live in today. As we talk about 21st century leadership, what we're talking about in terms of 21st century leadership is the realization of five key themes that we want for each and every one of our Badgers to have as they move forward. We want them to be able to think and problem solve. We want them, and they must be technologically savvy. They must be good in written and oral form with respect to communication. They have to have an ability to lead and follow in teams. The John Wayne model of leadership is gone. Leadership is about how we interact with one another. We used to refer to it as women's ways of leading and knowing in the leadership literature about 15 years ago. Now it's just the best way to do it. <laughs> that we have to have a comfort with diversity and difference. If we were to ask all of our students that came to the University of Wisconsin at Madison, more than likely many of them would say the following, particularly if they were white students. I grew up in a neighborhood that was mostly or nearly all white. I attended a high school that was mostly or nearly all white. Hence, when they arrive at the doorsteps of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and we know the world they're going to, and we are told by others that we have too much diversity. You're trying too hard. We don't even have enough to create the educational context that we know to be critically important to prepare young persons for the 21st century. More data. Data provided by academic planning and analysis as a part of a national study that we participate in every year, along with uh, many other institutions, the National Study of Student Engagement, asked a series of questions of seniors. We look comparatively at question number two, and we said, have you had a serious conversation with a student of a different race or ethnicity than your own? Students of color, 71% of them, statistically significantly different than, uh, than the comparative group, said, yes, I've had those questions. Because what we know is that even though we have a multicultural student center, even though we know we have these diversity programs on campus, historically underrepresented minority students in particular have a diverse and engaged and intercultural and intergroup experience each and every day they walk out of their residence hall. But when we look at the comparative group of majority students to ask the question in the counter, have you had those questions? 
only 49% of students could respond affirmatively. And the question is, we, don't, we have too much diversity? Students aren't having these questions? The thing we have done is we've made investments in critical programs that engage the Wisconsin experience, critical programs that are designed to create those moments for students, both locally, in the community, and globally. The multicultural learning community, our ethnic studies requirement, the Mortgage Center for Public Service, global internship programs in uh, the Division of uh, International Affairs, so many efforts designed to create that type of context. So the thing that I assert to those in the room who ask questions and have other questions is that the conversation needs to be reframed. The conversation must be reframed for each of us from this day forward that it's not about simply the morally or socially just thing to do. It's about mission fulfillment in the 21st century. It's about mission fulfillment as a great public university. It's about educating all of our students for the world they live in today. It's about more than simply body count diversity, just getting people on campus. It's not just about diversity, it's about the theme of inclusion. And inclusion resonates when you feel a sense of belonging. Do you feel connected on campus? Do you feel valued? If your hair is green, you choose to have relationships with individuals who are different in so many different ways. Do you feel valued when you walk down Langdon Street? Do you feel valued when you sit in the classroom and you're the only person who looks like you? And the stereotype threat exists in the air and you're afraid to raise your, raise your hand because of the persistent stereotypes about you. The themes and the issues that we work so hard to war against. It has to be a strategic discussion. And we need to continue to reify and affirm that this is a strategic priority for us. When I talk about diversity issues in the 21st century, I think we have to talk not only about that issue that exists at the top of the pyramid in terms of access and equity, but we have to be talking about a strategic diversity agenda at the base of the pyramid as well, preparing students for a diverse and global world, also to the scholarship and the research that our faculty do which is critically important to asking questions about health disparities, to asking questions about culturally relevant pedagogies, to asking questions about multicultural marketing questions, to asking questions about identity and immigration and movement across space. Those questions are a part of our strategic diversity agenda as well. And the idea and the theme that sits at the middle is the space that each and every one of us becomes a part of it. Do we live in an environment that is multicultural and it is inclusive? Whether you're a 39-year-old continuing learner, you're a member of whatever community you're a member of, do you feel included here? And there's so much work we have yet to do. That's probably the most persistent thing I get. They said that you're supposed to do this. Did you prove that climate? And the thing I respond back very, very quickly is that that's something that not one person can do on any of these issues. It's something that, as my good colleague um, Asima Kapani says all the time, we must do in community. That we must not seek to attack, but seek to understand. That we might not first seek to say, you didn't do, but say, how can we engage? You know, I heard this incredible uh, quote yesterday. It said, you know, somebody said, uh, uh, some might, people seem to have misinterpreted President Obama's uh, campaign slogan of yes we can is yes you will. Uh, and I found it to be very compelling because it, it, in, it, 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 in that one commentary it was this notion of how do we collaboratively and collectively engage around these issues. You know, we heard a little bit this morning about gender inequity. And we know that women are the majority of undergrad students at this university, but yet at the same time inequity still exists persistently, perniciously even. Only 19% of the engineering school uh, uh, gender, uh, gender diverse in that particular, uh, uh, looking at that particular college. Inequities exist in so many different ways, even as success has happened. And in that point, I find great complexity in a discussion of diversity. It's not that it's all good. It's not that it's all bad. It's that we're in an evolutionary moment. We're trying to continue to get traction. I know that uh, 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 individuals across campus are engaging these issues. As we look at underrepresented students, uh, again, by school college, uh, we see that the majority of our students are in letters and science. The highest percentage are in human ecology. 
One of the reasons I decided not to go too deep into these data is the exact same story I said last year. Doesn't mean that folks aren't persisting and trying very uh, intently to move the agenda, uh, but it does illustrate that this is hard work, that at times it seems glacial, despite our best efforts of colleagues in the engineering college, despite our best efforts of colleagues in the business school, in, co in spite of our best efforts from colleagues campus-wide. You know, I think about programs that don't get touted a lot. And uh, I had a, a nice uh, conversation with leadership in the Odyssey program, a program that I really wanted to highlight. By show of hands, how many people in the room are familiar with Odyssey? Uh, it looks like about a, about a third or so of the room. Uh, a wonderful program housed in the Division of Continuing Studies that focuses on working with uh, adult learners who face economic barriers to higher education. Uh, in its sixth year, students are able to take courses where they earn academic credit uh, with the ultimate goal of moving them on into post-secondary education, uh, moving forward with a very small, modest budget, but doing incredible work because it understood what Professor Nogueda spoke about this morning in terms of a community of care, a network of support. When you're economically vulnerable, if you are a head of household, if you have multiple members of family that you provide for, going to college and participating in these programs becomes all the difficult, diff, more difficult because of those competing complexities that don't allow you to engage. And so this program attempts to tackle those things. And I think that folks don't associate these themes and these types of initiatives with our diversity efforts, but they are. They're part of our diversity efforts. They're part and parcel of what we believe is important in terms of the Wisconsin idea, as are the programs that are consistently the brunt of question. These are also part of those, those programs that, that we value so much. That the success and the movement, particularly around our faculty diversity, remains our greatest challenge in many regards. Uh, I had a wonderful opportunity to speak uh, with my colleague, Vice Provost Steve Stern, uh, of faculty and staff, who's just an absolute gem. We had a chance to address all the department chairs and other members of leadership regarding some of the things that we were doing with respect to our faculty diversity efforts. And the thing that I say is, despite the fact that we've made some modest gains, we don't even get our fair share. We are amongst the most eminent research institutions on the planet, and we don't even get our fair share. One of the things that we created, and this was under the leadership of uh, Chancellor Biddy Martin, um, was a new faculty diversity initiative that I wanted to make sure everyone had awareness of. $750,000 allocated per year uh, that is managed uh, by Vice Provost Stern and myself, which provides some different types of supplemental resources uh, to help move uh, uh, the faculty diversity initiative along modestly. Uh, we've had four recruitment efforts. We just formally launched in fall of 2011. Uh, we've been able to get three acceptance. Uh, we're very excited about that and think that this resource, although not a lot, can help to make some of the margin of difference uh, that is so important for us. One of the things I get all the time, particularly when I go talk to ASAC, is we need to do more with uh, academic staff. Uh, also, when I talk to uh, colleagues who are uh, heavily involved uh, in leadership of our classified staff community, uh, we don't have nearly enough diversity. Uh, Kaleem Kerr, who spoke earlier, spoke to that. I think he used the comment that uh, certain communities weren't even part of the building of this uh, particular uh, structure. You know, and it raises the question, in what ways might we need to create a supplier diversity uh, type of initiative here on campus, such that we can look at who gets certain types of contracts. So we start asking questions about, is there a uh, diverse leadership team or a diverse uh, uh, employee base for those that we work with? One of the uh, new initiatives that's been created by my uh, fabulous colleague, uh, Mr. Dean Palau, recruitment coordinator in uh, Human Resources, is a brand new employment recruitment database. And we provide the information here, and these slides will be available to you by PDF uh, as soon as tomorrow on creating community. Um, for you to be able to go and access this. Uh, this individual has done a phenomenal amount of work trying to assemble a set of resources that can help us to find diverse talent that's out there. I know some of you in the room are equity and diversity committee chairs. Uh, one of the things we would love is to see that uh, a dean might be brought in to talk with leadership or to talk with individuals and offer this as another tool that could be complementary to some of the work that I know that you're involved with, particularly uh, the Wisely uh, search workshops uh, that they do, which are absolutely phenomenal. As I've said from the very beginning of my time here, we've made such investments in our efforts. 
but many of our gains will come from our ability to align ourselves. And I think that in my estimation, where we are today from where we were four years ago when I arrived, I feel like we're a little more aligned. Uh, I don't feel like we're quite those fish swimming around uh, all the time at odds, but there's more work yet to be done in terms of strengthening the schools, just such that we're, uh, uh, the schools of fish are moving in uh, the same direction. Uh, one of the things that we did is we uh, moved forward with a major reorganization of programs. And uh, we've been working very diligently trying to strengthen that vertical infrastructure, at the same time wanting to be porous and understanding that my role in particular and the role of my core team is a campus-wide role. Uh, I think we've done tremendous movement in that direction, but there's more uh, left yet to be done. Uh, one of the individuals I welcomed uh, to, to my leadership team recently was Dr. Eric Williams. I don't know if he's here. Is Dr. Williams here? Would you please stand? Please welcome Dr. Eric Williams to campus. He joined us from Virginia Tech University, and uh, uh, we're very excited to have him on board. And his office is in the Red Gym, and uh, he, he is in the process of onboarding with folks and meeting folks. And I didn't know if he was still here because he is getting married uh, this weekend, and so he is leaving. So let's congratulate him on that as well. Um, another individual we added to our central core team was Mr. Carl Hampton. Uh, who serves as special assistant in our office. And we've been trying to look at some of these infrastructures and asking questions just how could we do more with the resources that we have? Trying to creatively realign, trying to create more clear and defined support infrastructures. One of the things that's happened over the last six months is there was a working group uh, and individuals that were on that working group uh, that are here today, could you please stand? If you were on the working group that was working on principles, values, purpose, mission, stuff like that, they're kind of sprinkled uh, throughout the room. Thank you. Thank you. And it was a step in this kind of continuing reorganization. And this divisional working group, I asked them to think about the principles, values, and purpose uh, of the division and to think about names. And one of the names that uh, has emerged, and we're moving that forward as a recommendation for change, is that the office become the vice provost for strategic diversity initiatives and chief diversity officer, and the division become the division of diversity, equity, and educational achievement. What we're trying to do is we want the symbols to match the commitment. We want what we do to be reflected in those names. And so that committee played a tremendous role in getting us thus far. And I've already talked with some members of shared governance uh, uh, and we'll continue to be talking with them as I am talking with you. Uh, we think that that brings a 21st century focus to our work. And particularly if we're talking about a strategic diversity initiative as I have defined it here today, what we're not losing sight of is issues of climate and inclusion. What we're not losing sight of is issues of access and equity. But what we are shouting is that this has to be a matter of strategic and mission-centered purpose for our institution. Uh, some of the things that the unit has been involved with that I wanted to share with you today by way of, uh, of uh, awareness is where we've been spending some of the resources uh, within the division to make a difference on campus. Uh, and again, reinforces that idea of strategic diversity initiatives and educational achievement is that the lion's share of what we've been doing has been around academic enhancement initiatives. And this is through the core team of my office. Uh, also, intergroup relations, uh, leadership development activities, uh, pre-college outreach, and then research and scholarship initiatives that we're doing across campus. Again, trying to hit every part of that pyramid uh, as we engage in our work and are trying to become even better and more good stewards of our resources. Some of the things that we support is the writing center, the business learning center, the chemistry learning center, the math learning center, the physics learning center, the academic enhancement seminars under the leadership of Professor Alberta Gloria, which are so incredibly important to helping students who run into academic difficulty to get back on track, the Wisconsin Equity and Inclusion Laboratory, uh, the Wisconsin Day of Silence, uh, substantive support given to the American Indian Student and Cultural Center, uh, assisting members of the LGBTQ community to get to some important higher education leadership conferences, work that we did to support and establish uh, a new honors program uh, in partnership with the graduate school, the Edward uh, Alexander Boucher Graduate Honors, and so many other things that we've been a part of over the last uh, year that I wanted to just give you some sense of. 
Another initiative, and this is particularly, uh, I think, timely given the conversation this morning and the discussion around intercollegiate athletics and male youth of color is a partnership between colleagues in uh, the School of Education, specifically Professor Jolando Jackson of Ed Leadership and Policy Analysis and also Director of the Wisconsin Equity and Inclusion Laboratory and uh, uh, Deputy Director Sean Frazier of Athletics, as well as the wonderful team which provides academic support to students in intercollegiate athletics. What we want to do is we want to pivot to those issues we find to be strategic and important. Where other institutions are not, we want to be in conversation. Where other institutions are not focused on these things, we want to go there. And so this is one of those projects that comes in that context, uh, partially funded by the Lumina Foundation as a part of six projects nationally. Uh, a group of us came together to support it. It has a multi-dimensional leadership curriculum, professional development curriculum, life skills, mentoring, uh, culturally relevant advising, for credit opportunity, and it's done not in abstraction from the other work that already takes place with our intercollegiate athletes, which overall have a cumulative 3.0 GPA, uh, but it's work that is done in partnership there, particularly as we work to usher our students into the field of life in the same way that we usher them onto the field of play each and every Saturday and other days of the week. Other work that I'd like to highlight is work that's taking place amongst these major eight campus diversity programs that work with students. Um, Office of Multicultural Arts Initiative, People, Posse, Chancellors, Powers, NAP, Scholars, Academic Advancement Program, Pathway Students, uh, Center for Educational Opportunity. Highlight these programs because they touch roughly 50% of our historically underrepresented students. Not that they're any more important to the mission that we're all a part of, but that they're so influential in that they touch so many spaces, so many of our students working with them over the last three years, but there's a working group in particular that has been really pushing the envelope of how they do their work collaboratively, uh, how students participate in multiple groups, opening up a conversation that colleagues in the schools and colleges, and I also believe is critically important, how we engage the MDs in that conversation, and indeed how we engage the broader campus community. And that group is uh, expected to be releasing some, uh, a report and some recommendations moving forward. One of the things I do want to focus on just a little bit is the academic outcomes of particular programs. Um, as you can see here, uh, the programs that you all know very well, uh, People, Posley, Chancellor Scholars, Powers Nat, uh, graduation rates uh, between 69% roughly and 89% depending upon the program. Other programs, we're just starting to uh, tag them in particular ways to allow us to track those things uh, and be transparent about it. Uh, one of the, the pieces of data that's highlighted by the red lightning bolt is Targeted minority and academic excellence program. Targeted minority, of course, we define here institutionally as uh, African American, Black, Latino, Hispanic, Native American, uh, and Southeast Asian, uh, which is a terminology we use uh, to the system level and across every institution. Students who are in that demographic and who are in one of these programs, graduation rate around 75.1%. Students who are not in a program, graduation around 60%. Campus wide graduation around 82%. So one of the things it suggests is that students who are in these programs are doing quite well and, and clearly trending in the right direction of where we want them to be, if not surpassing campus norms. There's no disparagement here. There's no students who are admitted who could not perform. Of course we have students who would, take, uh, would like to go back and have a do-over. But generally, when we look at the numbers, we see things trending clearly and prominently in the right direction. clearly and prominently in the right direction. Other, respond, other, other aspects that we're trying to engage this work, uh, really trying to embrace this notion of shared responsibilities. One of the things I think that comes with having invested so deeply in these infrastructures is in some ways we can look over there and say, oh, that's just, the that's just that diversity program's responsibility. That's on, they're the only ones that need to share in that. And so we've been trying to aggressively open up other conversations around how we have that campus-wide responsibility to be engaged in this conversation. So we've partnered with the Delta Center, and they have a fabulous breakout plan for today. Associate Dean uh, Gary Essenmacher in LNS, uh, the Division of Student Life and Assistant Dean and Director Ren Singer, uh, with a number of initiatives that we've done from re-envisioning SOAR and how we're doing some things at SOAR to having a day-long retreat with the advising community generally, bringing them together for the first time in the history of the university in a day-long discussion with folks who do advising in diversity programs. 
just trying to find a meeting of the minds in a common space to have uh, understanding and shared conversation. Uh, in addition to the, uh, the project, again, that the Delta program is going to talk about today in a breakout session, which I think has incredible potential uh, as a way of engaging these issues at the site of the classroom and the process of teaching and learning. We just moved to the Red Gym. Several new folks moved to the Red Gym. Uh, my new assistant VP is there, Posse Omeyer there, undergrad research scholars is there, LGBTQ resource centers there, Division of International Affairs is there. One of the things we know is uh, we probably wouldn't have got there if we did things like we used to do things. But Dean of Students, Lori Burkwam and her team, uh, Dean uh, Gilles Bousquet, myself, others, came together in a spirit of asking how can we serve students? How can we use this space in ways that are going to maximize possibilities? Now, we all know that the most limited pro uh, commodity on campus is space. <laughs> so sometimes the conversations were interesting, but ultimately we landed on a solution that we feel very, uh, very prominent about and think that it not just creates new spaces for programs, but it creates new potential for interaction across the various programs and interaction across the various communities. I move to close. Um, one of the questions that's come up from a lot of people is we don't have a diversity plan. We don't have a diversity plan. We need a diversity plan. And my response to that is we may very well need a new diversity plan, but we do have a diversity plan. And I wanted to clarify what is a diversity plan uh, as we understand it from the organizational behavior context. There's three different types of ways that an uh, institution can have a diversity plan. You can have an integrated plan, a centralized plan, or a decentralized plan. We have institutionally at present an integrated plan which means that our diversity goals are infused in our campus-wide strategic plan. A centralized plan, by comparison, would be a plan like Plan 2008, uh, uh, the Madison Plan. It was a centralized campus-wide plan which had a dedicated focus on diversity issues defined particularly in terms of race ethnicity. A decentralized plan would exist in the various schools and colleges or divisional areas across campus. So the business school might have a plan, uh, pharmacy might have a plan. A couple of things I think are important as we look forward. Uh, I think that as we ended Plan 2008, it was particularly important for us probably not to go immediately into a new centralized diversity plan. Uh, I think it gave the campus a chance to uh, reflect and consider and, and think about some new things and approach this work in some new ways. Um, at the same time, I think it might be time for us to open another conversation if we would like to move forward in that particular way yet again. Uh, not in the same way we maybe have done it in the past, but learning lessons from the past that we build upon today. The other piece of it is decentralized plans. And one of the things I think is incredibly important is asking of our deans and divisional leaders to give an account of what they're doing, how they're doing, and to what impact. And so I've had some preliminary conversations with Chancellor Ward around that. Uh, around asking every dean in partnership with their MD and their E&D committee to present forward those reports that would give an account for where they are, how they are. And we have several other things that we anticipate rolling forward that will help with that process. One being a 402 audit that was called for and implemented by the UW system that we are waiting for final confirmation of their report around those resources that are $402 and dedicated. The other is my office provides substantive support to several learning centers and other spaces across campus, and I think it would be very important for us to ask questions about the impact and the outcome of those uh, initiatives uh, to engage in how we might ensure that we're being the most responsible stewards of our resources and moving forward in a number of different directions. That ends uh, the, the formal component of my remarks. It's my understanding, uh, according to Andrea Skalinski, who's in my office as well, that I have about eight minutes for questions. <laughs> Um, and so I would be very open to responding uh, as best I can to any question that might be proposed from anyone in the community. Hi, Patricia Brooks from Education Outreach and Partnerships. Yes. Um, Sagittarius. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I work for one of the many, many outreach programs for pre-college students on campus. And uh, one of the things that I noticed in your slides was the bar for outreach program support was pretty short. Um, but I also recognize that you said the Latino Youth Summit, and I want to thank you for your support of that. And we hope that we can continue that program, um, which is also in doubt because of the, our financial problems. But, well, across the state. But I really want to ask, um, in terms of what we've talked about today and the really important connection between K-12 
and higher ed. What is your commitment to supporting pre-college programs to, incre um, to increase that access to college for underrepresented groups? Okay. Well, I think that by the very context that we set up in this conversation, I would say that I'm deeply committed to that. Uh, at the same time, um, the question becomes, uh, where do the resources come from to continue to push forward? Uh, as you all know, we have the nation's largest pre-college to college infrastructure in the nation, the People Program, which works with nearly 1,000 uh, students across the state at the pre-collegiate level and has over 400 re uh, uh, enrolled on campus. Uh, that program funds into the eight figures. Uh, when people hear that infrastructure, they're amazed that we've made that type of commitment. So I think institutionally we're deeply committed. At the same time, we find ourselves in the greatest recession of the 20th and 21st century. Uh, these programs were held uh, uh, in a way that we were able to protect our gains with these programs in this difficult recession, not just in the current uh, 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 biennium, but in the previous biennium as well. So I don't know where the new resources are coming. But in response to that, uh, there was another slide that I actually pulled out of this deck because I didn't know how much time we would have. And it speaks to that issue. Because it's not an issue of not wanting to engage, it's an issue of having limited resources. And so one of the things that we're trying to do in my office directly is trying to put a real premium on uh, extramural strategic fundraising activities, whether that be identification of high capacity uh, principal gifts or going after uh, foundation grants or continuing to work in strategic partnership with corporate entities. And so we are in the midst of several projects right now that we're gonna be making ass and, and, and putting forward requests into the eight figures uh, well into over the next 12 months. And so it speaks to that issue of desiring and wanting to do more, but candidly not knowing where more will come from at present. Thank you, that's exactly how we feel. Yes, other questions? One of my favorite folks. <laughs> hello, hello. What's up, what's up? <laughs> My name is NECA. I'm here representing the Multicultural Student Coalition. Um, and I have a question about coalitions. Um, I think the most important way that students can get involved on campus is through RSOs, as we've talked about a lot. And I wonder, I apologize for not being here for the first part of your presentation. And mm -hmm. if you've already touched on this, I'll, you know, I'll catch up. But um, I'm wondering how, RS, through RSO involvement and empowerment, uh, what's the collaboration look like between um, that coalition and your office, and what is the charge from your office with respect to RSOs carrying out one of the centralized or even decentralized diversity plans? Sure, I, I think that uh, well, first off, I, as I have, uh, as we've talked about it at length, and uh, and I think illustrated in some particular ways. I, I think that being in community with students is very important. Um, I think that our students are the lifeblood of why we're here. Uh, I think that uh, great talent and gifts and leadership exists in our student community. Um, at the same time, I want students to be students and, and uh, do the things that are most important in terms of going to class and, and achieving academically. But uh, what we've tried to put in place uh, immediately, uh, recently, is uh, continuing in regular meetings with ASM, which is something different than we did before. We used to meet with uh, ASM diversity chair. Uh, and we, 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 those meetings kind of went away as the chair changed. We've now reinstituted those meetings that are taking place, uh, I think, every five or six weeks. Uh, in addition, I've already spoke with the ASM leadership once and anticipate that I'll come back multiple times through the year. The third thing that we've done is uh, made the decision to put Assistant Vice Provost uh, Dr. Eric Williams' office in the Red Gym as opposed to Bascom Hall to give more on the ground uh, leadership that represents my office, but yet is strong leadership that could provide a campus-wide perspective as well in order that we could strengthen the context of the student relationship. And so those are some of the ideas, uh, but I think that going forward as a po in terms of diversity plans, um, I'd love to hear the ideas of students around that. And I think it's not important just for me to hear it, but I think it's important for others in leadership to critically hear it. As we've talked about before, I think everybody knows what my office is doing around these issues. Uh, we need to have students ask respectful questions of other offices, other leadership, about how they can make equal con contributions similar to those that I'm making, Dean Burkwam's making, others are making. And so that's, again, something we talked about. Another thing, too, I think would be critically important. Uh, I think we are the great beneficiary of Chancellor Ward's leadership for another two years. 
Uh, there's not a more respected name in all of higher education, nor a more uh, respected and insightful voice of leadership. Uh, and so I think we are uh, uh, well poised in that way. At the same time, we need to be thinking about who the next full-time chancellor will be. And I think the student voice is going to be critical to that, that we have someone who comes in to continue to support uh, the diversity efforts that we're doing, and also, too, proposes the question of if institutionally we decide we would like such a plan, are they supportive of that or not? Uh, because the thing I've said to colleagues is that I can't say we're going to create a diversity plan. That has to be a shared conversation of leadership in multiple spaces. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. My Hello. name is Nicole Carlisle. I'm a master's student in the School of Social Work and also a TA. Um, to give a little context for my question, um, I'm a TA for a class on working with racial and ethnic minorities. And something that comes up that I find to be frightening is that we have juniors and seniors at the school who have never heard of white privilege. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what your office is doing to make white students aware of what their privilege is and then also to engage them in some of the multicultural activities that are going on in campus, right. which typically white students do not go to. Right. It's, it's a great point. So, you know, I refer back to the data that we had here, uh, which makes the data-driven point that echoes the exact point that you're making. So what are some of the things that not just my office is doing, but what are some of the things that we're institutionally doing? So my office supports the intergroup dialogue program, the intercultural dialogue program, we work in partnership on a number of different things. Um, but I think the, the, the most critical traction point that we have on this is engaging it in the curriculum. Uh, and I think we have an ethnic, we have, I know we have an ethnic studies requirement that has been in existence now for some time. And there's a committee, a faculty-led committee, which is looking at asking questions of that requirement. I think we might need to more prominently not just ask questions, but engage faculty in a conversation of how we could strengthen that requirement, how we might contemporize it for the 21st century, such that maybe it's not just ethnic studies, but maybe it becomes a course that situates around conversations of difference, power, privilege. Uh, we've done some things uh, through the leadership of uh, Seema Kapani and Will Clifton, who have the Student Seed Program, which really focuses into these issues, and they have now gotten that course moved in such a way with the assistance of um, a faculty member in education uh, that allows for it to be used as a fulfillment of that requirement. So I think more conversation there is important. I've also opened up conversations with uh, Assistant Dean Ren Singer in the first year experience, uh, director of the Center for First Year Experience, about how we might approach the introduction of some of these themes early on before students even become a part of the community. One of the things I talk about in terms of organizational change is understanding where leverage points are. So one of the leverage points is the curriculum. We turn that leverage point in the curriculum, we can hit all students. We turn that leverage point in first year experience, we can hit all students. So I see those as two incredibly important and prominent places. Some of the other places we might want to look for traction is maybe how we engage these issues amongst students in leadership in various organizations who maybe don't come to these spaces, don't come to these conversations. And so one of the things I'd like to do is I would like for us in 2012-13 to have a conference on campus for student leadership and diversity issues. And in this conference, I want to frame it in such a way that it be not about you're being told that you're something or that you're broken, but it be framed in such a way that we frame the conversation today in that this is the world we live in and it's an opportunity for us to all get better. I have been told that I am out of minutes. Uh, we have other wonderful guests that are here. I'm going to break us today. Uh, we do have sessions uh, throughout the building, and so uh, I'm going to direct your attention to the program. Uh, such that you know uh, the various sessions uh, that will begin after the break at uh, 1.15 uh, to 2.30. And we have engaging the faculty in diversity efforts, Dr. Jennifer Sheridan of Wisely, and that's in the fifth quarter room on the second floor. We have reconciling federal, state, and institutional policies with Dr. John Burkhart and his graduate team, and that is on the third floor. We have examining the campus climate with the WE Lab uh, research team, and that is also on the third floor. And last and definitely not least, the Achievement Gap Project with uh, Dr. Uh, Don Gillian and Chris Dakes, which is uh, industry room third floor. Thank you.